Hello and welcome to the 14th Annual Cultural Conference for the Luxembourg American Cultural Society. Uh, for those just joining, my name is Serena Stitchen. I'm the museum curator here at the LACS and I will be moderating this conference. As you all may know, we normally hold an in-person uh, cultural conference as part of our Luxembourg Heritage Weekend festivity festivities uh, that usually happens on the second weekend in August every year. Um, this was and is not a normal year for anyone because of the COVID-19 global pandemic. Our board of directors made the decision uh, to not hold any in-person activities for our Heritage Weekend this year. Um, some events were postponed until next year, while others, uh, like this conference, were made virtual. And the, the silver lining of making this conference virtual is that we're able to bring you uh, more content and you can join in from the comfort of your own home. Uh, so I can only hope everybody is as excited as I am uh, with our topic this year. It's very timely. And last year marked the 100th anniversary of passing of universal suffrage in Luxembourg. And this year marks the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage in the United States. These events happening on different continents during the same time frame speak to the broader movement that was happening in the world at the turn of the century. And these presentations show how these movements were created, where they failed and where they succeeded. And these presentations will show the similarities and difference of events happening on different continents at the same time and how those events help to shape the future. So um, before we uh, do get started with the presentations, I do want to thank our sponsors. Um, so this year, we our sponsor is the Luxembourg Ministry of Culture, the Michaels Family Trust, and I want to thank the Wisconsin Humanities Council for their grant, which allowed us to make this conference free, um, aside from a small technology fee. So our first speaker we will be hearing from is Dr. Brene Wagner, who is a Luxembourgish historian and journalist. She has collaborated on different research projects uh, in, um, excuse me, on Luxembourgish history at the University of Luxembourg. Her research areas being the social history of 19th and 20th century Luxembourg, gender history, and emancipation movements. Uh, she's worked as a lecturer on oral history at the University of Luxembourg and is now co-commissioner for an exhibition on the 100th anniversary of the introduction of universal suffrage in Luxembourg, organized by the Luxembourgish Parliament and the National Museum for History and Art. Right. Thank you for the kind invitation to speak uh, about uh, women's suffrage and also uh, for presenting uh, my person so nicely. I'm really happy to share some thoughts and insights on a crucial historical period for Luxembourg and for Luxembourgish women with you. Uh, in 1919, uh, as Serena said already 100 years ago, universal suffrage was introduced in Luxembourg, thus enlarging the electoral body by many Luxembourgish men and all women of adult age. The Grand Duchy thereby experienced a political change not foreseen before the First World War. Although in the USA and other parts of the uh, so-called New World, women had already received voting rights before, for European standards, uh, women's suffrage was introduced quite early in Luxembourg. What were now the reasons for this daring step and what role did women play in the process? In order to answer this question, my presentation will briefly describe the historical context of the suffrage debate in Luxembourg in the 19th and beginning of 20th century, before focusing on the introduction of women's suffrage. It will explore reasons for the absence of a strong women's suffragist movement, outline the influence of British and North American uh, women's movements on public opinion in Luxembourg, and dwell on the role of World War I in social change. Finally, the presentation will sum up the concrete political debate on women's suffrage from 1917 to 1919. Luxembourg uh, was ruled by a census electoral system since the days of the French Revolution at the end of the 18th century, 
a system which continued under Napoleon I under the Dutch regime from 1815 to 1890 and even in the decades before World War I. This census system meant that only those who could pay a certain amount of taxes had the right to participate in political elections. The census was the minimal amount of taxes necessary to become a voter. Luxembourgish electorate thus never surpassed a part of 65% of the adult masculine population until 1919. However, as you can see on the chart, the proportion, the proportion of voters among the population varied with uh, the level of the census in the course of the 19th century linked to political developments. For instance, the pressure for universal suffrage during the revolution of 1848 led to a reduction of the census, meaning that uh, more men could vote. Uh, the census uh, system was or the voting system was indirect in the beginning and then became direct in 1848 and stayed so until nearly continuously uh, nearly continuously until 1919. In the constitution of 1868 the minimal and maximal height of the census were pinned which proved to be of great importance for the following discussions. From now on universal suffrage could not be introduced anymore without changing the constitution. As I said, universal suffrage had already been asked for in 1848, but without success. Universal at that time meant only men. The question of women's suffrage was not even discussed in Luxembourg at that time, although in France, the first women fought already for political rights. After that short pop up, the question of universal suffrage disappeared and it was only in the last decennia of the 19th century that debates began on the reduction of the census or even on universal suffrage. There were several incentives to this. One was the consolidation of the workers' movement and of the socialist ideology. The international socialist movement influenced Luxembourgish workers as well and starting with 1892, Demonstrations for the International Workers' Day were held in Luxembourg. Linked to this aspect, another important catalyzer was the influence of the parliamentary debates in the neighboring countries, which touched not only on the suffrage itself, but also more generally the question of emancipation, namely of the workers. While in France, universal masculine suffrage had been introduced in 1848, in Belgium and in Prussia, men only enjoyed plural, respectively, three classes voting rights. Besides the principle of political equality, other aspects were discussed, namely minimal age, compulsory voting, or the new proportional electoral system, which was seen as a more democratic alternative to the traditional majority system, as it was based on the representation of all societal groups. The question of women's suffrage, again, was never mentioned. The societal position of the workers' movement changed fundamentally from the end of the 19th century to the First World War, with the governmental development of social legislation only firing the demands for a larger social and political acknowledgement by the spreading workers' unions. From 1890, until 1913, the census was reduced five times so that the part of electors rose from about 15% of all adult Luxembourgish men to over 60%. The sheer numbers show that there was a strong movement in favor of a democratization. It was not limited to the left and the progressive uh, liberals, but since 1911, it was at least partly and more prudently supported by Catholics of the Christian social current. The first elections after the 1913 reform in June 1914 brought the occasion for workers to get elected, but two factors limited this possibility, the majority system which favored well-known politicians and the bloc politics, uh, that means the electoral concertation of socialists and liberals in order to beat the Catholics in the majority voting system. <clears throat> 
However, a new generation inside the workers' new movement turned itself against the bloc politics since it worked on the expense of the revolutionary orientation of the party. The First World War bore heavily on the lower social classes. 1916 saw the creation of the first iron workers' unions at large scale, and in June 1917, only some months after the beginning of the Russian Revolution, a large strike broke out in the iron industry. Even if it collapsed after some weeks, it showed that the workers could not be ignored anymore. Only one month later, the socialist deputies introduced a resolution in parliament in favor of universal suffrage that was adopted unanimously. Since the suffrage system was anchored in the constitution, a constituent cham chamber had to be put in place in order to change it. The question of women's suffrage was still not clarified at this point. Either this was a strategy to obtain unanimity, or more likely, the question did not cross the minds of the deputies. I come now to the reasons and conditions of the introduction of uh, women's suffrage. The beginning of the 20th century was a time of political questionings and of demands for modernization in many societal sectors. The women's question, as it was called, was one of the big issues that agitated public debates. As I have shown right now, uh, women's political rights were not discussed by the political class, but the so-called women's question meaning the role of women in a quickly changing professional and social world was a political issue also in Luxembourg. Women's uh, scholar education had until then been disregarded. It was thought that as housewives, manual workers or peasants, they did not need a serious formation. Suffrage rights were closely linked in 19th century to education. Only those who could read and write were supposed to be able to follow the political debates. If this argument concerned men as well as women, uh, compulsory education was only introduced in 1881, women were particularly discriminated. It was generally admitted that young girls did not need to pursue their school education after primary school, access to university was nearly impossible. Better families sent their daughters to French pensionnats. Those that were less well off had the choice between Catholic boarding schools or the so-called normal school, which prepared young people for the teaching profession. When in the neighboring countries, women were finally allowed to follow academic studies, there were nearly no women in Luxembourg who were in the position to take that choice, since there were no secondary schools for girls where they could have been able to get their diploma, indispensable for admission to a university. Only female teachers with a very good leaving certificate were admitted to academic studies. The fact that in 1909 a girls' secondary school was created was in itself a sign for the societal changes that could be observed since the beginning of the 20th century. The new school came about uh, that uh, yes, came about due to the initiative of the Verein für die Interessen der Frau, the Association for the Interests of Women, founded by Alid Meirich de Saint-Hubert, spouse of the most important patron of iron industry in Luxembourg. This club brought together liberal women, mostly from a bourgeois context, which lobbied for the creation of a girls' secondary school. The success of its militancy motivated the Catholic movement to create its own women's association, strongly oriented uh, towards charity and religious, religious activity, but also acting as a conservative opponent of the liberal women's association. The Catholic Church, who enjoyed a strong position in Luxembourgish society, was worrying about morality in a school not led by nuns. And in Parliament, the clergyman, a clergyman and politician, Pierre Schiltz, deplored that men would now be exposed to competition in professional life. Moreover, he stated, there were already domestic science schools where girls could be trained to become good mothers. And I quote, what we want most of all for our daughters is a good education. 
if we can't have both, we would rather renounce learning than good education. Because only good education can provide those good mothers of which Napoleon says that they guarantee the stability of the state. But the fact that women now did have access to the universities in the neighboring countries, uh, for Luxembourg did not have a university of its own at that time, made it possible that in Luxembourg the first women with academic degrees appeared, which could then choose new professions. Thus, Anne Beffel, uh, the lady you see here, the first woman in Luxembourg to obtain a doctoral degree, became a teacher in the new secondary girls' school. With the improved public education, one argument against women's suffrage was considerably weakened. But this was not the only reason to de deny them political rights. Women, especially married women, were excluded from a range of civil rights since the days of Napoleon. The logic of the Code Civil of 1804, which he implemented also in Luxembourg, implied that married women were dependent from their husbands by law. They lost different civil rights, had to obey their husbands, and had to ask them for permittance for different decisions. Unmarried women did not have these problems, but all women, whether married or not, were excluded from political rights. Legal discrimination of women, like the political, was so self-evident in the 19th century that it was nearly not discussed publicly. More generally, the role of women was seen as separated from the public sphere. The social role and the natural mission of a woman, so it was said even by liberal thinkers, was to organize familial life and to take care of children. The idea of equality was understood as a complete uh, assimilation of women to men and emancipation of women already claimed for by feminists was refuted. At the end of uh, the 19th century, however, uh, already uh, John Stuart Mill referred to the illogical argumentation of liberal men, quote, who have a real antipathy to the equal freedom of women, unquote. Thus, the only way to mention women's rights publicly was in a negative way by ironic press articles on feminists in other countries. From the end of the 19th century onwards, uh, the suffragettes or the suffragists, um, I should say, fought publicly for women's rights. And most prominently, the British, the British suffragettes raised awareness with spectacular actions to discrimination of women. The campaigns of the suffragettes were often used as a negative model by the European press. They were represented as would-be men, femme fatale, or violent furies. In Luxembourg, there was no suffragette movement. There was, in fact, no proper suffragist women's movement at all. Women's suffrage had never had a strong lobby in Luxembourg, and the feminist cause continued to be a marginal subject even after the appearance of the first women's association. Aline Meyrich de Saint-Hubert's Verein für die Interessen der Frau, which was active from 1906 until the beginning of World War I, did not want to play this role. The issue of women's suffrage was only broached rarely by the liberal women through the organizing of conferences with German suffragists. But the association made clear that it did not officially campaign for women's suffrage. The Luxembourgische Katholische Frauenbund, the Catholic um, Association for its share, was against women's suffrage. It only was to militate in, for, in favor of women's vote in 1919, after it had already been adopted by Parliament. The only movement that explicitly uh, advocated for women's suffrage was the left wing of the Social Democrat, uh, Democratic Party that had been founded in the beginning of the 20th century. It is quite remarkable that the Social Democrats uh, Party explicitly accepted members of both sexes, something the other political movements did not even think about. And even before the appearance of the Verein für die Interessen der Frau in 1905 and 1906, 
the party introduced a parliamentary petition claiming universal suffrage for both men and women. In Parliament, the demand received only roaring laughter, a sign that uh, for uh, that uh, excuse me, a sign that by the census uh, parliamentarians, women's suffrage was still seen as an absurdity. The Parliamentary Commission charged with the analysis of petitions even stated that women were to be counted among the incapacitated minors of civil life and that therefore it need not discuss it. In the numerous uh, parliamentary debates that were led on the reduction of the electoral census, the deputies never tackled the subject of women's vote, not even the progressive ones. How then did it happen that Luxembourg counts today among the countries where women's suffrage has been introduced quite early? Uh, the first factor that has to be mentioned is, of course, the First World War. Luxembourg was occupied by Germany immediately, whereas on the political and legal level, the country continued to function more or less independently. The iron industry, the most important industrial sector at that time, was transformed into a war industry for Germany. Soon the workers and their families experienced extreme hardships. High prices for comestibles and lack of food provoked severe hunger. Hunger led to anger and mobilized the population for political and social reforms. Second factor, the call of the international workers' movement for universal suffrage had become a central demand. It stood for the whole striving for a new society where all humans would be equal. And in that spirit, universal suffrage meant suffrage for men and women. The Russian Revolution in 1917 contributed to this uh, mobilization and was a model for the European workers' movement, also concerning women's suffrage. And third factor, the constitutional reform that had been planned in Luxembourg for a long time was now being seriously considered. The debate on the revision of the constitution that began in November 1917 had been initiated by the resolution of July on the introduction of universal suffrage, but soon broadened, on, broadened, broadened onto other of its articles, especially focusing on the question of people's sovereignty, the scope of action of the monarch, or the separation of state and church. In their engagement for universal suffrage, the socialists soon found an unexpected ally, the Catholic Party. The socialists suspected that the Catholic Party uh, wanted to come into power by way of the universal suffrage. And in spring 1918, four constitutional articles, articles were declared revisable, among which the one on suffrage was accepted with unanimity. In the social uh, democrat movement, women's suffrage stayed an issue from the beginning onwards, especially in the party press, where the influence of the discussions in the German workers' movement is notable. But there was no real mobilization for it until the end of 1917, when the party adopted a resolution in favor of universal suffrage for men and women. It was the project of the constitutional reform that gave it a new relevance. And it was at the crucial moment of June 1918, just in time for the fixing of the revisable articles of the constitution and of the elections for the constituent assembly, that socialist women started their work of mobilization. Beside information meetings and articles, it is a public petition demanding women's suffrage that can be counted as the most important of its elements. It was initiated by the party treasurer Jean Meyer Heuke, the later communist Margrit Hai Fink, and Margrit Mongenas Zerve, which you see here, member of a progressive liberal family of steel industry patrons, but who had become a socialist. While the form of a petition was in itself a moderate instrument, a look at its text shows that women's suffrage was not seen as a revolutionary issue, but as a means to secure women's place as equal citizens in the existing society. Four main aspects were touched upon. 
the political consensus that had been reached concerning men's universal suffrage since the beginning of the century, the fact that the code civil, the civil law code, did regard women as citizens as long as uh, their obligations as taxpayers or their penal responsibility were touched, certainly the progress that had been made as concerned uh, girls' education and women's presence in all professional sectors, and as a last point, the war. Women, so the petition text stated, had shown themselves to be able to meet the demands of present life, that is to say, of everyday life during the war. The petition for women's suffrage was distributed in the French and in the German version. It is interesting to note that in the German version, explicit reference was made on the suffrage movement in other countries. And I quote, Considering that all the countries of North America, even Iceland, I did not know that it counted to North America, Northern Europe and Austral Asia have introduced women's suffrage. The Luxembourgish women who have neither civil nor political rights, indignant to be always put on one level with idiots and prisoners, demand that the gentlemen deputies examine this question receive their demands favorably and confer them the right to vote, the active as well as the passive one. This petition gained several hundred of signatures. This was not enormous, but it surely had its effects on the politicians. One proof of this is the fact that I have found several signature lists in a dossier of the prime minister, although petitions were normally conserved by parliament. Evidence is also furnished by the wording of the new constitutional article on universal suffrage by a special parliamentary commission. This commission that started its work in autumn 1918 retained a formulation that women's vote could be introduced, could be introduced, um, it's important, later by a law which could also fix, quote, its modalities and its restrictions, unquote. The liberal uh, deputy Robert Brasser, who had submitted this proposal, may have felt very innovative in proposing an article foreseeing that women's voting rights could be given to women by law. But this was, of course, not what the socialist women had strived for. Yet even the socialist deputies in this commission agreed with the text. Luxembourg could thus well have followed the path of France or Belgium, where women's suffrage was only introduced step by step and became complete only after World War II. However, history took a different turn. The constituent, the new uh, constituent chamber elected in order to change the revisable articles of the constitution, was put in place on uh, 27th of August, 1918. Uh, this uh, chamber moved on shaky ground. First, there was a high minimum of present deputies and a large consensus needed to be able to adopt the new articles. Second, the government fell in September and had to be replaced. It only held until December. And third, the end of the war brought a social and political crisis that Luxembourg had not experienced before. From November 1918 to January 1919, there was a Republican, partly revolutionary movement that was driven by progressive liberals as well as by socialist workers. As soon as the German troops left, workers, peasants and soldiers councils appeared uh, a little bit like in Germany and also in France and Belgium. There were several popular demonstrations during which demands were formulated such as universal suffrage, the eight hours working day, workers' participation in industry, social and health security, and most of all, the republic. Inside parliament, Liberals and socialists took over the demands of the Republican movement. On the 13th of November 1918, a parliamentary resolution to press Grand Duchess Maria Adelaide, Marie, Marie Adelaide to resign failed by just two votes. However, a resolution by the Party of the Right, the Catholic Party, 
which suggested a referendum on the question of the future form of the state, got a majority. Women's suffrage was still not an issue and Emil Reuter, the Minister of State, just hinted at the possibility to let women take part in that referendum. One week later, however, Reuter sent a bill project to the State Council which explicitly opened suffrage rights for women in the context of the planned referendum. We don't know yet how Emil Reuter, leader of a Catholic party that had until then never militated for women's suffrage, came to take this turn. It is plausible that Reuter inspired himself from Catholic parties in other countries who had already tried to take electoral advantage from the fact that there was a Catholic workers' movement. And there was in Europe a conservative feminism that emerged sometimes from within political Catholicism. But above all, from the left to the right in Luxembourg, there was a strong conviction that women, as soon as they had the voting rights, would vote Catholic in their large majority, standing under the influence of the church. In this logic, it was also clear for the politicians of that time that women would support monarchy. In any case, Reuters' decision had for consequence that the Catholic press strongly mobilized for the holding of a referendum and already started to appeal to women directly. In January 1919, a petition for maintaining monarchy gained over 80,000 uh, signatures, according to the Catholic newspaper Luxemburger Wort. Reuters' decision thus had been a strategical move in order to win the referendum but it had direct implications on the constitutional debate. The Catholics had made a sensational political turn in standing up not only for universal men's suffrage, but also for women's suffrage. At the end of uh, December 1918, the company of military volunteers mutinied. On 10th of January 1919, the Republic was proclaimed but monarchy stayed in place, protected by French troops, which you see here uh, on the photo. The Grand Duchess resigned only to be replaced by her sisters on the 14th of January, her sister Charlotte. And uh, it is in this atmosphere of confrontation that the debate on the constitutional reform started end of January 1919. The following months showed that the design of the new suffrage system became a decis decisive question and that several elements of its new structure were played off against each other. One of them was women's suffrage and the position of the Socialist Party in this context merits specific attention. If the mobilization by the socialist women had not provoked a broad societal debate, it may have influenced party members and put pressure on socialist deputies. It was through their request that women's suffrage was now integrated in the reform project. However, even the socialist deputies shared the view that women would vote conservatively. Thus, Adolf Krebs, a socialist deputy who presented the uh, amendment for introducing, introducing women's suffrage, uh, said, I uh, quote, we consider the vote of women as a question of principle, a question of equality. Same duties for all, thus same rights for all. We see in this also for proletariat's uh, means to strengthen its influence, because with women's suffrage, the vote of workers will be doubled, and doubled will be their influence. But he also considered we know very well that women's vote does not benefit the socialists at the elections. By the liberals, women's suffrage was strongly disapproved. Their speaker, Robert Brasser, uh, whom I mentioned already, in trying to find arguments against it, even drew on theories saying that the brain of women was smaller than that of men. He also felt that women should be kept out of the political sphere, asking, quote, is woman equal, inferior or superior to man? An unsolvable and futile question. She is different. She has another social role. 
because it is the woman that forms the man as a spouse and as a mother. She exerts such an influence on his moral development. The reasons that determine my friends and me to speak out against women's suffrage are all to their honor. It is for respect of women. It is for respect of their dignity and the social role that is assigned to them that we do not want to let them descend into the political arena and to convey them to share the bitterness and the harsh struggles of political life." Unquote. The liberals thus stuck to their position that women were not or were not yet fit to vote. In April, the socialist deputies on their side showed their unstable attitude when they agreed to accept the liberal proposition of only giving women the vote for communal elections in return for the liberal support concerning another element of the new voting system, the panachage. But this transaction failed and on 30th of April 1919, the liberals quit the plenary session, leaving the parliament with lack of quorum. The liberals had to look for other partners which they thought they found in the populist Freie Volkspartei, Free People's Party. On 18th of May, however, when the decisive vote on women's suffrage took place, active and passive suffrage for women got the votes of the Socialists, the Catholics and the Volkspartei against those of the Liberals. The day afterwards, the Catholic paper Luxemburger Wort wrote about the, quote, priceless fooling of the liberals. Women's suffrage thus was adopted and on 15th of May the new constitution came into force. On 28th of September 1919 the outcome of the referendum was a plebiscite for monarchy. In the following elections of uh, 26th of October 1919 the first to be held under the new constitution, the Catholic party gained an absolute majority. And uh, um, the, um, I have to find my words. Where women, uh, were women thus the conservative element that brought about these votes? That is at least what not only the contemporaries thought, but what you can read also to, still today in many Luxembourgish history books. A closer looks, look shows that there were many new voters that made these constellations possible, especially the poorer peasants from the north of the country, but also Catholic workers whose impact has not been analyzed until today. Four women were candidates at the first elections in October 1919, three of the Socialist Party uh, and one of the Catholic Party. Only one woman got elected, the Socialist Marguerite Thomas Clement. She stayed in Parliament until 1931 and uh, committed herself to women's rights, but she was also a speaker in domains that we would consider today as typically masculine, such as financial politics. Uh, after Marguerite Thomas Clement, there was no woman in parliament anymore until uh, 1965, so that was uh, more than uh, 30 years. I come to my conclusion. The developments I presented show that there were several factors that played a role for women's vote. Among them was the international influence of the workers' uh, movement, war itself with its new distribution of soci societal roles, uh, the consequence of, consequences of hunger on the political mobilization or the development of the social and political crisis during the war with its large breakout in the winter of 1918-1919 and of which we will also uh, speak tomorrow. The new position that education had brought to young women can be cited as a specific factor that contributed to the introduction of women's suffrage, but also the decay of the old bloc politics between liberals and social democrats, a true product of the census system. However, it is also clear that without the strategical turn of the party of the right to grant suffrage to women, Luxembourg might rather have followed the path of Belgium and France. 
while the suffrage question lost its political edge and its revolutionary allure through its um, embedding in the parliamentary debate the revolutionary tendencies and the claim for a republic after war's end made it a trump in the hand of those who fought for a democratic change and the modernization of the country for the conservatives feared that the upheavals would indeed lead to a revolution as it was the case in other countries the element of women's suffrage however seems to have had a more ambiguous role it was charged with unproven suppositions on how women would vote once they were allowed to their perception as a conservative element in the electoral process was common among both conservative and progressive men the debates on the constitutional reform show that the negotiations between the political groups were strongly influenced by strategic attitudes but these strategic attitudes based on this preconception, even if socialist deputies in the end returned to a more principal approach. As one deputy uh, put it, the socialists, even if they would lose the electoral battle, were going to stuck with women's vote for the principle of equality. Thus, the introduction of women's suffrage in Luxembourg was not only about equal rights, but also about images men had of women and of their role in society. Thank you for listening. Thank you again, Dr. Brackner. That was very interesting. It's something that um, I'm, of course, not as familiar with, uh, with the entire history of universal suffrage in Luxembourg. Um, but it's, uh, it was very interesting to see the sort of so many similarities and little bits um, that were very similar within uh, suffrage movements that I've studied, you know, and throughout the world and in the United States. Um, and I do have one question myself, um, if you wouldn't mind expanding a little bit more um, on sort of, you mentioned how World War I was uh, uh, an instrument of change for, for women's role. Um, and could you just talk a little bit more about um, about that of women, um, how their role changed within World War I. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, that was uh, indeed a very important factor. Um, World War I was a very special situation in Luxembourg because of the steel industry. And perhaps you know that in the steel industry, there were very many migrants who worked there, especially Italians and also Germans. And when the war broke out, all these workers were called back to their countries or left uh, of their own will and this uh, led to a situation where there were not uh, enough uh, workers anymore in the steel industry and that was the first time that women were asked to work in the steel industry it was never it had never been the case before and it was stopped directly after the war uh, so uh, you see already that there was uh, really a new role uh, of women in society uh, besides that uh, women were the ones who had to um, to uh, look for food uh, and uh, who went to the north of the country as we have uh, seen on on the picture the the, uh, the picture of um, pierre blanc uh, where he shows how people go and ask for potatoes and ask for food because they have no money anymore and uh, because they have so much hunger. So they were really, uh, uh, they, they, they had really to, to go uh, and knock on other people's door because they did not have anything to eat. So uh, women were very confronted with uh, this uh, uh, situation and uh, we have uh, testimonies of, um, market uh, situations where women fought against each other or uh, against the, the vendors uh, of the food because everybody tried to get something so it was really very different from uh, the situation before of course there had been social problems in luxembourg before but uh, this was had never been experienced before so in that sense women had really um, come to play a new role okay all right well thank you um i have a few questions from the audience um nice. from john majerus he is asking uh, when did women in germany get the right to vote 
Mm -hmm. So in Germany, it was um, in some ways uh, very similar uh, to Luxembourg, or one could uh, say it the other way around. Luxembourg was similar to Germany. Um, directly after the armistice, uh, when the war was over, uh, the Republic was um, put in place. And uh, also in that moment already, it was decided that women should uh, have uh, voting rights. So uh, what is different um, uh, in comparison to Luxembourg is that there was a strong women's movement in Germany and it was um, not only a socialist one, but in uh, all the parties, uh, who, uh, women uh, engaged themselves uh, for, for the mm -hmm. vote, at least in the last years before, um, before 1918. So, in fact, one could say that uh, this victory of women in Germany also had some impact of, uh, in, in Luxembourg, although we don't have any sources, but it seems plausible that uh, this victory uh, led to uh, led people to think that okay we have to do it here too uh, but there are no no uh, sources who show that uh, precisely okay mm -hmm. all right um another question from eric ross once women had the vote in luxembourg what policy changes came about because of the way they voted uh, and today, do women tend to vote for particular parties or a particular political orientation, left versus right, for example? Mm -hmm. So, uh, like I already said, the first elections, it was very clear uh, that the uh, Catholic Party had won the elections since they had gained the absolute majority. But one has to say that already in the elections before the liberal socialist bloc uh, had suffered a lot and um, uh, at the elections of summer 1918 for the constituent assembly the liberals had really experienced a disaster so this trend was already there uh, but of course uh, it is possible that women uh, contributed to the victory of the conservatives uh, one i only spoke now of the suffrage uh, subject, but in fact, uh, what what occupied people a lot was the question if Luxembourg would survive uh, as an independent country. And so this was mingled up, uh, uh, this question of the independence of Luxembourg with the referendum. And it uh, surely has um, influenced people, men and women, to, to vote for the Catholic party because they were the most uh, credible in this question. Now for the, the changes uh, in policy, one has to say that uh, in fact women were not really t uh, taken into account after 1919. So not uh, by the parties uh, and um, we have uh, this one woman, um, Katrin Schleimer-Kiel, uh, who had um, put a candidature for the Catholic party. She had not succeeded, but she also um, left the party because the, she thought that it was not feminist enough. And she created a women's list and also um, a list uh, later on with uh, as much women as men. So she was very modern in her time, but this shows that uh, some women, the women who had fought for voting rights were not not happy at all. So the the interwar period was really one where women noticed that uh, the parties did not take them seriously. And as for mm -hmm. social change or, or even laws uh, for women, for example, uh, the civil emancipation of married women, it was uh, discussed uh, by by feminists, but it did not. Uh, there was no move until uh, 19. Uh, uh, the 1960s, it was introduced in 72. So you see uh, how strong the, the anti-woman's <laughs> movement was in Luxembourg. So one can say that the political rights did not lead concretely to, to um, better conditions for women. Okay, thank you. All right, and we have another question from Elaine Patnode. How did you get interested in this topic? I know your um, your dissertation was um, 
oh, of course, now I'm forgetting it. I had it right in front of me. <laughs> um, but uh, about um, gender studies, and you did uh, teach on gender studies uh, at the university. But um, if you want to talk a little bit more about how you got interested in this in this topic or how you got involved in the um, exhibit at the National um, History and Arts Museum. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that's an interesting question. In fact, um, and it, it gives me the possibility to speak about Luxembourgish historiography because what um, really um, uh, to, to say it concretely pissed me off when I was young was that uh, the question of uh, women's suffrage and other questions on women were simply not treated in history books. Uh, in Luxembourg, women did not seem to have existed before. And that was uh, not only me, but also other um, historians uh, got the idea that one had to, to do research and that one had to work everything uh, up. And, um, the, the, my first work, uh, larger work uh, at university was about the, the introduction of uh, women's suffrage in Luxembourg. So it was a, a smaller um, uh, work, but I had the chance to uh, publish it in Luxembourg and it had some success because many people saw that this was simply a chapter that was not there. And uh, I think it was very um, symptomatic for Luxembourgish histori historiography of that time that uh, such subjects were not treated. There was social history, but it was always about uh, workers and uh, steel industry. So um, this has changed a lot at um, Luxembourgish, at the University of Luxembourg. There are no, now many um, uh, works being done on uh, the gender question and also on uh, rights of uh, women. Uh, but I must say that we still have no special chair or uh, it's still uh, a little bit on the side and um, one uh, hope that I have is that uh, women's and gender history will be in, in, integrated in, in the more general history that it should not be uh, separated anymore. Well, we will see about that. Okay, about the exhibition. I think it was also because I had this um, research experience that I had the chance to participate in uh, in this project. But was, what was important for us with the exhibition was to show that 1919 is not only about women. And perhaps I did not say it enough now. Uh, the fact that we had this census system meant that there were many men also who could not vote before 1919. And so in, in, uh, in uh, 2019, we also uh, um, looked at that. Uh, we, we wanted to show people that uh, it's about uh, everybody. It's not one group of the society, at least in Luxembourg, it happened like that but uh, the universal suffrage was for everybody. And uh, the, the exhibition, uh, perhaps if there are people among you who have the chance to pass the borders and to come to Luxembourg, it's still open until the 6th of uh, September. So uh, it's, um, I think it was rather a success and I'm, I'm very happy about that. Yeah, yes. Definitely. And this next question actually uh, ties right in with what you were saying. And if you just want to expand a little bit more, um, somebody asked if there were any exclusions from the universal suffrage um, that was passed. Um, yes. Um, in fact, I did not explain that, but if you listen carefully, uh, when I summed up the, the text of the petition, the women said that they did not want to be treated like the fools and the prisoners. And that was uh, the that was uh, traditional exclusions in the laws in Europe that uh, these people were not allowed uh, to vote. And this had has only been changed uh, at the end of the 20th century, I think. And another exclusion I did not talk about is um, a very large uh, number of people, the people who were not Luxembourgers. I don't know how this um, 
development was in the United States, but in Luxembourg before 1841, the nationality of the people was not so important. It was important that they could show that they had money, but the nationality was did not play such a big role as it played afterwards. And it was only in the middle of the 19th century, in the constitution of 48, that the condition of Luxembourgish nationality was introduced. And it uh, had uh, a more and more important role. And that meant also that also already in 1919, many people were excluded. And uh, today, as we are a country with many nationalities um, and with a large part of the population not being Luxembourgish, it means that uh, we have nearly a census system uh, today. So there are nearly half of uh, the adult uh, population who are not allowed to vote. And then one point um, which changed uh, was that um, already in 1919, the minimal age for voting was uh, reduced uh, to 21 years. And in 1972, it was reduced another time uh, to 18 years. So these are some of the changes that took place. Okay. okay. Well, thank you for that. And we've got a few more questions. Um, so, and we do have, still have some time. Just gonna check clock. Okay, yes. All right. Um, so the next question that I have for you, and I just scrolled past it. So let me get back. Ah, there we go. Um, uh, so this is from Sab Sam Siebenaller. He asked, um, voting started the equality movement. Do women today have pay equity to men, management, upward mobility, business, and good opportunities? Um, if that's something that you can uh, speak on a little bit. As I did our... not get it uh, acoustically. Could you repeat? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, so voting started the equality movement. Do women today have pay equity to men, management, um, management upward mobility and business and opportunities? Okay, so if I understand well, it's about if also in other sectors of society, uh, women have a better standing today. Is it that? Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I think that in Luxembourg, um, the fact of political rights, as I already uh, tried to show it, also uh, has not led directly to emancipation of women. It was uh, clearly a strategic move and the parties did not really think in equality, except perhaps uh, the socialists, but they did not always behave uh, like <laughs> their principles uh, said. And um, after the Second World War, there was a very strong movement in Luxembourg for women to uh, stay at home. It had already begun in 1919. Uh, married uh, women were told to leave their jobs, uh, especially um, teachers. Um, and uh, it, this uh, was uh, such a, a strong tradition that people thought it was in the laws. And it was, in fact, not. This um, led to a situation where, where many women stopped working when they got married or uh, after the first child. And this had, uh, uh, has only changed after Second World War because then uh, young women got better educations. They had other um, uh, ideas about how they wanted to live their life. And in the, of course, with 1968, uh, that was also that also belonged to the cultural revolution that women wanted uh, changes and today um, I would say that um, in uh, let's say in the text Luxembourg is very well off we have really a, a very clear text about equality but in the concrete life it's uh, not always uh, so nice for example in the industry and uh, financial sector in the in the administrative administrative councils of these uh, big societies uh, there are not many women for example in parliament we have now a situation where we have less women than before and uh, I think we never uh, got uh, over the 25%. So 
now we are with 18 or 20 percent of women in parliament it's different in uh, on the communal level there uh, women have more success but one sees that there are uh, barriers and glass ceilings in luxembourg too right and that's i mean uh not exclusive to luxembourg to say that is definitely um something seen throughout the world i believe uh, all right, and I've got another question for you from Mandy Tausch. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wagner. Very interesting. I did not know much about the steel industry. Was it the 1900s when the steel industry started to grow? Do you think the outside influence of immigrants helped influence the change in politics for the country and helped push the suffrage movement? Uh -huh. uh, so I know you touched on this a little bit before. Yes. Um, well, yes, that is interesting. Uh, in fact, the um, uh, steel industry was very important in Luxembourg. It, this started already at the end of the 19th century, and it was an all-male industry, uh, but uh, with many workers coming from abroad, uh, uh, but uh, in reverse, uh, Luxembourgish workers were also going to Germany or to France. So this was, these movements were very common in steel industry. And uh, it, it is true that uh, especially the Italian workers, but also the German workers brought new ideas to Luxembourg. Uh, for example, socialism, anarchism, and they also were often more organized that, than uh, their Luxembourgish colleagues. So. One can say that uh, the early history of the social democrat movement is very strongly uh, influenced by the international workers movement and these ideas were brought by the migrants uh, into the Luxembourgish uh, workers movement. And uh, I think that, um, for, for instance, uh, women's suffrage is a good example because it was the international the Socialist International, that means the, the Federation of Socialist Parties, who had fixed that uh, the parties in the different countries should uh, engage themselves uh, for women's suffrage. And I'm not sure if that had not been the case, how the Luxembourgish socialist uh, workers would have been uh, uh, positioned towards this question. I think I have to yes okay yes i think there is a certain influence but it's difficult to um to really uh, find sources concrete ones on that mm -hmm. okay all right well uh and that is all the time that we have um thank you again so much dr wagner um we really appreciate it